I have a little share screen thing that says we're going to get started. Hi, everybody. We'll get started in just a few minutes. So sit back and relax. And we'll start right at 7. Hi, friends. Hope everyone's doing well. <laughs> 
All righty, at seven o'clock, we'll get started. Um, hello, welcome to the Fall Journalism Lecture Series. Uh, my a brief introduction here. I'm Will Yerman. I'm the Norman Eberly Professor of Professional Practice in the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications Journalism Department. And I'm gonna introduce our guest in just a moment, just a few quick notes. Um, as I always like to do, I wanna thank Joe and Shirley Eberly for making tonight possible. They established the endowment that funds uh, many of the activities we're able to do for students, including tonight. The endowment honors Joe's father, Norman Eberly, who graduated in the 1920s from Penn State, went on to a long career in journalism um, and writing, and this uh, endowment honors his professional work. We got two more lectures this fall as part of the series. Um, there won't be any lecture next week in honor of the election, so please go out and vote. Uh, the following week on November 11th, uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette former journalists uh, Michael Santiago and Alexis uh, Johnson are going to talk about um, their experiences at the paper, what happened to them there, and, and how they've moved on and why they've moved on. And then the following week on the 18th, um, uh, DC photographer Tom Brenner, who covers the White House and politics, is going to uh, talk about his work and his career, and I'm hoping we'll have some interesting post-election stories. Um, if you've never been in a Zoom webinar before, you can sit back and relax. We can't see you, you can see us. So you can wear your pajamas, take off your shoes, kick back, whatever you want. Um, depending on your, your device at the bottom of the screen, you'll probably see a Q&A button. You can submit your questions there. And Daniela will get to those at the end of her talk. Um, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Our speaker tonight is Daniela Zalkman. Um, she's a amazing documentary photographer who splits her time between Paris and New York. At this very moment, she's in Paris where it's midnight or something like that. She's nodding, yes. Um, she's a multiple grantee of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. She's a fellow with the International Women's Media Foundation, a National Geographic Society grantee, and the founder of Women Photograph, which is something she'll talk about tonight. I was looking at her photos again this evening and was struck how some of the images feel to me like prose. They're kind of documentary in the way I think about documentary photography. And then other images felt very much like poetry to me. And I was really struck by that range of images. So I'm really excited to have her tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Daniela, and, and uh, I'll be back at the end to help with any questions that we have. Thank you so much, Professor Yerman. It's an honor to be here. And that is quite the lineup of speakers you have coming for the rest of the semester. I am going to share my screen. on this. Um, as Professor Yerman said, I'm a documentary photographer. Normally, I like to split my time between Paris and New York, but with the state of 2020, um, I am very much in Paris. Uh, we literally just got locked in for uh, about a month, so I, I will not be going anywhere. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I'm, I'm usually on the road traveling about 10 months of the year, and so I'm going to share a little bit about sort of the evolution of my career and that trajectory and then the projects that I'm currently working on that mean the most to me. Um, and I'm very happy to be transparent about any part of my process, the technical side, the journalism side, the business side, anything that you wanna know. So um, while I don't think that I can really see questions as we go, I'm happy to answer anything at the end. So thank you so much for tuning in and let's get started. Um, so this is my, first ever professional news clip as a journalist. Um, I have probably wanted to be a journalist since I was about 12 or so. Uh, I grew up in the DC area. I was the editor of my middle school literary magazine and the editor of my high school newspaper. And I, I definitely knew I wanted to work in journalism. And to me, journalism meant newspapers. That was sort of the, the pinnacle of what it meant to be a journalist. And so I decided that I really wanted to go to college in New York. I didn't really care where. I didn't really care what I studied. I just wanted to be in New York so I could start working for, interning for, stringing for uh, publications there. And so I was lucky enough to be accepted to Columbia and ended up at Columbia University. And the first thing I did when I got to campus was I joined the student newspaper. Um, and I actually started out as a reporter and a news editor and uh, sort of accidentally fell into photography very serendipitously. And one day my sophomore year, the then president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad came to campus and he was speaking at Columbia. And because he is who he is, the security on campus was incredibly tight. And most of the wires and the news outlets in New York City could not 
get in to Columbia to photograph him. And so the New York Daily News, um, which may hold a different place for you uh, students now than it did for me, uh, God, 13 years ago. Um, but at the time was sort of a very beloved paper that I think has had the fourth or fifth largest circulation in the United States. Um, they called the student newspaper office and they said, hey, we can't get in, but is there a student who could possibly photograph this for us? And so I happened to be the person who picked up the phone and I wasn't really a photographer at the time. I was much more of a writer, but I said, yeah, absolutely. I, I can definitely photograph that for you. And so this was the front page of the Daily News the next day. And I ended up freelancing for the paper pretty much four or five days a week for the rest of my time as a college student. I skipped most of my classes. Please don't do that. Don't do as I say, not as I do. Um, but it was it was a really great way to get a start in journalism. I, I was studying architecture um, partially to make my parents happy. Um, and luckily I had professors who understood that I had really found the thing that I cared about that I wanted to do. And they were very gracious and very understanding that I was maybe going more towards that path than, than the thing that they were teaching. So I spent the next five years, both as a student and a few years after that covering everything you possibly can as a photojournalist in New York City. So from building collapses to crime scenes, to fires, to emergencies, just, you know, I think very early on my model was Ouija, if any of you are familiar with his work. Um, this, you know, very old school New York City style of tabloid photojournalism, because that's what I was embedded in. Um, and in a lot of ways, I'm grateful for that training. Uh, you know, being a newspaper photographer in New York City means that you have to be super versatile. You have to be able to and willing to photograph anything. You have to be able to photograph politics. Uh, so this was almost exactly 12 years ago. This is the uh, DNC in 2008. Very, very different political campaign than the 2020 political campaign. I photographed a lot of sports, even though I am highly unqualified to photograph sports events. I photographed a lot of fashion. I am equally unqualified to photograph fashion. But again, you know, as a newspaper photographer, you're a generalist. You have to learn how to deal with everything. You have to be able to do everything. And in particular, as a tabloid photographer, you, you kind of sometimes have to be willing to bend the rules a little bit. You're, you know, maybe applying a slightly different set of ethics than people who are going to J school and the things that you guys perhaps are learning, which I very much hope you respect and honor. But, you know, I, I was encouraged to trespass and impersonate and do a lot of things that are much more in the sort of early 20th century style of tabloid photography that I absolutely do not do now. Um, but it was, it was a start and I learned a lot and I learned how to be fast and versatile. And I loved that time. I learned so much, but I also realized after about five years of working for newspapers, uh, mostly the daily news, but I also started freelancing a lot for the Wall Street Journal, I realized that my strength and the thing that I loved most as a photographer was really connecting with people and being able to sit down with them and learn about their life story and somehow translate that into photography. And the thing that was frustrating for me about newspaper photography is that assignments often last from 15 minutes to three hours. And that's very often the window that you're working with, unless you are you know, a big shot staff photographer and you are given the resources and the time to work on a multi-day, multi-week, multi-month story. You really, you don't get all that much time to interact with the stories you're working on. And, and that became very taxing for me, both sort of in a journalistic sense and an emotional sense, because I'm, you know, I am a deep empath. My skill as a photographer, as a journalist is connecting with people hearing their stories, really being able to connect in that way. And so five years in, I realized, you know, this maybe, maybe newspapers aren't the pinnacle of what journalism is for me and what I want to do as a journalist. And so I started to think, okay, how can I maybe figure out different ways in which to work? How can I figure out different ways to tell stories as a photographer? And, you know, the problem is when you're 22 and you want to work on long form documentary stories, you haven't proven yourself yet. There's, there's really no established route for you to go to the New York Times and say, hey, I want you to send me abroad or send me to this place to work on this story for a month because I know that's the way in which I will be my best self as a storyteller. That doesn't really cut it for photo editors. So 
what I ended up doing is I, you know, I would work my butt off in New York. I would save up money. And then I would take about a month every year and I would send myself somewhere where I thought there was a significant story that was interesting, that was critical, that was of the moment. And so in 2011, the story that really caught my eye and the eye of a, a very good friend who's also a freelance photographer at the time was the fact that South Sudan was becoming the newest country in the world. And that felt like a critical, important thing. And so we both, you know, scraped together our savings and we decided, all right, we're going to go to East Africa for a month. We're going to document the independence of South Sudan. We're going to see what stories we find. And of course, as reporting trips go, as all of these things go, we got there and we got mired in bureaucracy and we ended up having to spend two weeks in Uganda waiting for our visas to go through because we didn't understand that even though South Sudan didn't exist yet, they still had a separate embassy and you had to apply for a separate visa. And so we, we just, we had two weeks of dead time in Kampala with really no access to the thing we were trying to document. And so I started Googling from my hotel room in downtown and I read about the fact that the first openly gay person in Uganda, the first LGBTQ rights activist in the country had been murdered just a couple months prior. And so I reached out to that community and I connected with some of the activists and I ended up spending the next three years working on this project, looking at the rise of homophobia in East Africa and looking at this anti-gay law um, that ended up garnering quite a bit of press. Um, and I'm not gonna go in depth into this project in particular, but, but that really was the moment where I realized, okay, there is a way for me to work in communities on a story for a much longer period of time. And there's a real reason to do that because a year later, the Ugandan parliament actually passed that anti-gay law. And at that point, having spent a couple of weeks in this community, having the connections, understanding, not a ton, but a little bit of the context and the nuance of the story, I was able to go to a nonprofit in DC uh, called the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and say, hey, I know this community. I know what's going on. This is a really important story. It's actually getting a lot of coverage, but no one's really photographing it. And I want grant funding to go back to Uganda to be able to spend a month documenting what this means for LGBTQ people in Uganda. And so because I had invested that time, because I had that connection, because I knew people who now trusted me and who understood what I was trying to do, what my motivations were, this nonprofit said, okay, sure, we can, you know, we can fund this trip. And I think the, that first grant I applied for was probably about $3,000, which in terms of nonprofit journalism grants is pretty small, but it was enough to keep me working for about a month. And I went and, you know, this became a project that I returned to. Um, I probably went back to Uganda about seven times over the course of three or four years. And so that, you know, that really became the first time that I realized there, if, if it is the thing you want to do, if it appeals to you, there is a real strength and a real necessity for slow, long-term journalism. Because unfortunately, that doesn't always fit the news cycle. And that's, you know, that's something that I had experienced firsthand working for newspapers. And I love newspapers and I love the way in which they work. But the problem with the newspapers is they have to come out every day, right? You have to have stories in them every day. That daily news cycle is brutal. You constantly have to be churning out stories. But the, the flip side to that is that you, you don't always have that time. And especially as outsiders, especially as journalists who so often are outsiders in the communities they're documenting, we don't always, in, in that brutal rapid news cycle, we don't always have the time to really understand the historical context and the nuance and the cultural context of communities that we just drop into and are trying to understand and write about or photograph. Um, and so that, that was sort of my first taste of, oh, this, this feels different. And this feels good that I am now coming back to a place that a year later, two years later, three years later, I get to return to people and to stories and to places that I now feel like I know deeply, who trust me, who understand what I'm trying to do. I understand them. And this, this is something different. This is a different method. This is a different way of working. So from that, I, in a very roundabout way, was led to another story. Um, I, you know, this work in Uganda was maybe also sort of the first time as an American that I started to think about the legacy of colonialism and what that means. Because I think as Americans, we, you know, we grew up in the United States, we're disconnected from European imperialism and just how devastating that was and what it means and how much it is still present 
in global politics and the economy. And we also kind of forget that America is an imperial power in its own right. Um, but, I, but I started to think about what does it mean to frame our existence and our understanding of these power structures through the lens of colonialism. But I, you know, I was working on the story in Uganda and one of the, the small sort of offshoot stories that I worked on looked at how when you criminalize sexual minorities, when you criminalize gay people, there is almost always a spike in HIV rates because people don't feel safe going to the doctor or seeking healthcare. And so people get more sick, they're less safe, it happens. So you know, I ended up at this AIDS conference in Australia in 2014. And I read this single throwaway line in a UN AIDS report that just referenced the fact that the group of people in the world with the fastest growing rate of HIV was actually indigenous Canadians, First Nations Canadians. And I am not a public health expert, but that made no sense to me. You know, I, I don't know all that much about HIV. I don't know all that much about how it spreads, but you know, for, for those of us, and I'm assuming most of you guys are Americans, Canada has much better healthcare than we do. It's nationalized, it is accessible. Generally speaking, if you want medicine or access to doctors or access to hospitals, it is very cheap or even free. And yet there was this genuine epidemic in a, you know, an at-risk community that was just clearly not being dealt with. And so, you know, I wrote another grant application uh, to the same organization, the Pulitzer Center, and I spent about a month driving through Canada from British Columbia to Saskatchewan to Ontario. And almost every single person I encountered who was HIV positive and indigenous told me about their time in something called Indian boarding school, Indian residential school. And unfortunately, I can't really see you guys and poll you and I wish I could, but I'm, I'm curious to know how many of you have heard of Indian boarding schools before. At that point in 2014, as a 29 year old, I had never heard of them. It was not something I learned about in middle school or high school or university. But for those of you who are unfamiliar in the 1870s, the Canadian government created a network of boarding schools for indigenous Canadians. And the stated purpose was to forcibly assimilate them into Western mainstream culture. And so children were literally kidnapped from their communities by a government agent called an Indian agent. And they would be taken to these boarding schools where they were essentially punished if they tried to speak their language, if they tried to practice their culture, they, they, their names were changed, they were forced to convert to Christianity. There was rampant physical and sexual assault. Um, there was a lot of medical testing that was done on children. A lot of young women were sterilized. Just unspeakably horrible things happened to 150,000 indigenous children in Canada. And the kicker is that the last school didn't close until 1996. So I'm in Canada working on this project. I think it's this thing about HIV and those prevalence rates. And then I'm, I'm opened up to and I'm introduced to this entirely different story that I have never encountered before. That seems like this massive chapter of our collective North American history that I've never been exposed to. And in the meantime, I, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I consider myself a journalist. I have been making photos as I go of the ways in which urban indigenous people in communities in Canada spread HIV, which is through injection drug use. And so I'd taken a series of images that documented that. And those photographs were honest and they were real. And they told a story that was important in its own way. But I got home and I realized I couldn't publish those photographs. And I, you know, I don't need to show them to you because you know what they look like, you've seen images of people dealing with the opioid crisis in the United States and Canada, you know what those images look like. They don't necessarily inspire us to feel empathy. They don't necessarily explain anything more to us about the opioid crisis, about HIV, about injection drug use in general. And so I realized, I, you know, it, it was journalism, but it wasn't good journalism. And so I went back to the Pulitzer Center and I essentially said, I am so sorry. I screwed up, I didn't get it. I, I thought the story was this thing, but the story is actually this other thing. And I, I really need to go back and I need to do this different thing. And also my photos are gonna look a little weird, please trust me. And luckily, because I had established a rapport with them, I had already worked with them for a few years. They said, okay, crazy girl, do whatever you need to do. And I went back and I decided that, you know, as you maybe can see from some of these images, that instead of making straight documentary news photographs, 
what I needed to do was to create double exposure portraits of boarding school survivors who had gone through the system overlaid with the sites and the memories of their boarding school experiences. Because unfortunately, you know, the last one of these schools closed in 1996 and I didn't have the capacity, the ability to photograph that experience, but it was still deeply ingrained in the reality and the memory and the history of so many Canadians. I, you know, I mentioned that 150,000 Indigenous Canadians went through this system, 80,000 of them are still alive today. It was very heavily weighted to the late 20th century. And every single person I talked to had some connection to these schools. And if they didn't, their parents did, or their aunts and uncles did, or their grandparents did. And so I was learning about these ideas like intergenerational trauma and the things that we pass from generation to generation and how they continue to impact us and what cultural genocide meant. And so I realized that truly a straight image was not going to do the story justice, was not going to honor the stories that I was hearing from all of these people who were trusting me with their own histories, with their own memories. Um, and so, so this series of images was the best way that I could come up with to, to visualize that context and that history. So I've, I've been working on this project now for basically six years. Um, and it's very important to me. I've now documented boarding school survivors in Canada, the United States and Australia. Um, I have at least 10 other countries I'd like to work in. Unfortunately, pretty much anywhere in the world that a colonial government has come into contact with an indigenous population, some version of the coercive assimilation boarding school system has popped up. So the Norwegians did it to the Sami and the Japanese did it to the Ainu and it's existed all over Latin America and in North Africa and South Asia. I mean, just literally everywhere in the globe, some equivalent has existed. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm Vietnamese American with my mother is from Vietnam. My grandparents are from Eastern Europe. They're uh, Jewish immigrants who were fleeing the Soviet Union. I'm not indigenous and I've spent a lot of time working now in indigenous communities telling indigenous stories. And I believe in this work. I believe that it is important to share this history because it is our collective history and we need to understand it and we need to know about it. But I think there is also a problem with, especially in communities of color, only focusing on stories of trauma. So a huge part of the work that I've done over the past year has been to look at, well, what are the solutions to this particular and very horrible form of oppression? What has been the way in which indigenous communities have combated the boarding school system? And one of the more spectacular answers to that has been the Hawaiian educational sovereignty movement where indigenous Hawaiian activists in the 1980s, um, at which point Hawaiian language was still criminalized, was still not legally uh, something you could teach in secondary schools. And a bunch of activists, uh, some of whom are pictured here, decided that they were gonna fight back and they were gonna start opening Hawaiian preschools and elementary schools, um, and that they were gonna figure out a way to create immersion schools so that young people could start learning Hawaiian again. Because in 1980, there were fewer than 50 native speakers under the age of 18. And so the language was endangered, it was going to die out. And this tens of thousands of year old culture was at risk of losing its way of communicating. And I think, you know, it's easy for us to forget how much language shapes our understanding of culture, that the ways in which we frame our syntax, the ways in which we connect to each other through language are deeply tied to so many other forms of culture. But for Hawaiians, being able to connect to the Hawaiian language is deeply connected to being able to understand the landscape and nature and the ways in which Hawaiians engage and interact with nature. And the potential loss of that was devastating. And so this, oops, sorry, this group of educators founded a preschool that technically at the time was illegal because the American government still had a ban on teaching Hawaiian language, but they got together and so they, they called it a nursery. It wasn't technically a school and they essentially brought in grandmothers and grandfathers to come in and just speak Hawaiian to young babies. And now that school system spans, you can be three months old until you're 18 and you can go to school in Hawaii entirely in the Hawaiian language. Um, and I've been able to photograph some of these families where they were raised their children entirely in a Hawaiian language households. And it is this incredible reversal of the thing these boarding schools were meant to take away. Uh, 
on a very different note, this is an, another project that I've worked on for about five years. Um, I'm based in Europe. I've been based in Europe since 2012. Um, and about five years ago, I think in 2015, when the Syrian refugee crisis was really reaching its peak, I started to feel this deep sense of guilt because I've worked all over the world. I spent a lot of time focused on East Africa, North Africa, but I was literally in the backyard of, of this really major news event. And I, I had really done nothing on Syrian conflict, on what was happening to millions and millions of Syrians who were fleeing their homes and trying to find a new place to live, a, just a safe place to live in Europe. Um, and so I went to Calais, France, which is a small town right on the English Channel. Essentially, it's sort of the, the main port in France that then allows you to get to the UK. Um, and I, this is the first person I met when I went there. Calais is home to what I would call one of the worst refugee camps I've seen in my life. And I have seen refugee camps in Haiti and Central America and South Sudan and Kenya. I, I've seen some terrible places. None of them have been as bad as Calais um, where asylum seekers and refugees from Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and Eritrea and Ethiopia are all simply trying to find a better place to live and a better life. Um, and so I met this young man named uh, Hassam. Uh, we're the same age at the time. We were both about 27, I think. Um, and he started telling me a little bit of his story. He, you know, my Arabic is non-existent and he didn't speak all that much English, but he started telling me a little bit about his journey. And so I photographed him and I spent a lot of time, you know, he, every night he would try to either break into the Eurotunnel or get onto one of the trains or get onto a truck or get onto a ship, desperately trying to get to the UK because for some reason in his mind, that was sort of the pinnacle of what a safe, proper life would be. And I was photographing that and, you know, I believed in the importance of that, but at the same time I had, you know, I'd come into his journey at the very end, effectively. He had already gone from Raqqa, Syria, which is his family's hometown, all the way traveled overland through Turkey, gotten on a little rubber boat in the Mediterranean, gotten to Greece, gone through Croatia, got, you know, just traveled all the way across the entire European continent. And I hadn't been able to photograph any of that. And so it felt like, you know, I, I can show a little bit of a story, but that feels deeply incomplete. And then he pulled out his phone and he started showing me all of these photos that he had taken. And I realized, well, Great. I, I don't even need to document the story at all. We can, his photos are significantly more important here. This, this is the real story. This is what matters. And, you know, not only did he document, you know, this is the ferry landing uh, in Kos, Greece, where he made this incredibly dangerous crossing in a rubber boat with 60 people, which is about 30 people more than a boat like that should be able to carry. And then, you know, the, the horrible conditions. Uh, this is in Croatia, the second photo on the right. Um, that they dealt with and essentially just marching over land across Europe trying to find shelter. Not only had he taken those photos, but he'd also taken selfies the entire way as well. And, you know, what more millennial perfect way to show and document what it means to be a refugee in 2015, 2016 than through this series of images. And it was, you know, everything from showing this horrible sea of people who are all just trying to make it to literally being on a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean to you know, being a tourist. He passed through Paris on his way to Calais because he heard that's where he needed to go to get to the UK. And he decided he wanted to see the Eiffel Tower and this just incredible breadth of experience and imagery was so much more important than anything I could have possibly documented unless I'd found a way to you know, go back in time and, and travel with him the entire way. So you know, I, I put together this piece that I published that featured both my work, but more importantly, featured his work. And then I got a, a DM on Instagram and it was from someone named Majid and he said, hey, I'm Hassan's older brother and I really like your piece, but you should come do a piece on me and I'm currently in Norway. And so I said, obviously, yes, I bought a ticket. I went to this tiny mountain town in the middle of central Norway called Ol, where uh, Hassan's older brother, oldest brother, Majid was in essentially an asylum processing center with about 30 men, again, from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Iran, Iraq. And he spoke fluent, perfect English. And he started to tell me more about the Ahmad family. And he said, well, look, so 
there are six adult siblings in my family and all of us had to flee. You know, our parents are in Qatar and they're safe there, but none of us legally have the right to live in Qatar. We're from Raqqa, which is essentially the capital of ISIS. And we had to go on the refugee trail and each of us decided there was a different country we really wanted to get to. And so even though we are super tight knit and super close, each of us has ended up in a different country. And so I have essentially spent the last five years trying to piece together a portrait of what life is like for this family, what it means to be so tight knit and so loving, but have to essentially only engage with each other, only interact with each other via WhatsApp and Snapchat and videos. And maybe that's actually more relatable in 2020 now that we're all doing that, we're all relating to each other digitally. But in 2015, this was, this was a much more heart-wrenching, terrible thing to imagine. Um, this is the Ahmad's parents, uh, this is Swad at home in Doha, and she it just is in a constant state of terror and worry because she doesn't know where her children are. You know, on this day, we were waiting to hear from Mohammed Noor, the youngest child, about whether or not he'd made it safely to Denmark and just the, the stress and the unknowing was eating her alive. And you know, if you guys think about your own moms and how they would feel if they just had no idea where you were, if you were safe, if you were able to find a place to live and sleep and eat and be comfortable and safe, you know, that, that would be crippling for them. And, and that was the experience she was having. I got to learn more about the family and the way in which they grew up. They grew up, you know, the, again, as with most Syrian families who went on the refugee trail in Europe, are very working class. So, you know, the or sorry, very middle class. They're all hyper-educated. Dad is a physical therapist. The mom works in a hair salon. You know, they had a very stable, perfect life. And then ISIS literally came to their hometown and just blew up their city. Um, and so I, you know, I started visiting all of the other siblings. So this is Basma, the only daughter um, with her two children. They ended up in the UK. Um, in addition to documenting their lives in the present, I also looked at the ways in which they had been communicating and sharing information. So, you know, when each of the siblings was on the refugee trail, marching through Croatia, marching through Italy, wherever they were, they would send texts to their family group chat. And so this is, you know, a photo of one of the younger brothers with his nephew strapped to his chest, texting a selfie to his siblings. And then, you know, in a, a happier resolution to the story. Last July, I was able to actually attend Majid's wedding in Tunisia. Um, he had ended up getting residency in Norway, and he would go back and forth to Athens, where he had spent a bunch of time as a translator, helping other Syrian refugees, because he spoke really perfect English, and he'd work with aid workers, helping to translate. And he'd go back and forth every once in a while and bring supplies. And while he was there, he went to visit the Parthenon and be a tourist. And he met this young Tunisian woman while he was at the Parthenon. And last July, they got married, and I was able to be there. A sort of happy chapter in this otherwise very sad, melancholy story. Uh, to switch gears again, this is another project. Um, you know, after five, six years looking at indigenous identity and cultural genocide and what that means in the United States, um, I think it's it's been important and interesting for me to take a step back and think about what is our relationship to indigeneity in North America? What does it mean for us to occupy stolen land, to acknowledge it and understand it as stolen land, and also still consider the fact that, you know, up until very recently, we had a sports team in the city where I grew up named after a racial slur. You know, the, the Washington Redskins, that is a terrible word. That name should absolutely not have persisted as long as it did. Um, and we still, you know, a, across the country in pretty much every pro sport, maybe with the exception of basketball, there still exists, you know, the Blackhawks or the Indians or the Braves or the Chiefs. We have so many different ways in which we have literally tokenized indigenous identity. Um, and I was especially curious at thinking about that relationship in terms of children, teenagers, because we, you know, we don't necessarily question these things when we're kids, right? You know, that we, we grow up in systems and so we don't really think about them in the same way that I grew up in Washington, D.C. and didn't really question why is my local football team named such a horrible thing. You, you know, you can't really expect a 14-year-old to question, well, why, why do I go to a school that is named for the Chieftains or the Redskins or the Braves? 
Um, and so I went to Ohio and spent a few weeks looking at high school and middle school teams that were named after indigenous symbols because Ohio happens to be the state in the US with the highest concentration of native mascots. The United States now still has more than a thousand high schools uh, with native themed mascots. I'm willing to bet that some of you in this classroom may or may not either have attended schools that had native mascots or knew of some in your hometowns. This is Logan, Ohio. And that, you know, once we make that permissible and okay at a middle school and high school level, it becomes a lot easier to then think it's okay at a pro level as well. So, you know, this is Chief Wahoo, the mascot of the Cleveland Indians. He was officially retired at the beginning of 2019. Um, but as you can see, he still is worn on a lot of the paraphernalia and a lot of the uh, jackets and hats and, you know, any, any other uh, clothing that fans come to the stands with, come to the stadium. What's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, terrible at sports. Uh, yeah, anyway, come to baseball games. Um, and, you know, this is a deeply racist caricature and, and these things continue to persist in the United States. Um, that started to extend for me. I, this is a project that I did for National Geographic in 2018, 2019. That started to extend not just from sports, but to the general ways in which we view indigenous history and indigenous identity in America. So the ways in which we sort of continue to fetishize indigenous identity is this thing that only exists in the past. We wanna think about chiefs and warriors and braves, and we don't really wanna think about what it means to be indigenous in the 21st century as people who, like the rest of us, use cell phones and computers and have very normal day-to-day -day lives. And then the last thing that I'll share from my work is, um, and again, sort of continuing that trend of thinking about futurism and what it means to not just focus on historical trauma, but find ways to translate those stories and those narratives into something futuristic and positive as well. Um, uh, someone I'd been involved in an exhibition with a few years ago decided that he was going to stage a reenactment of the largest slave uprising in US history. And I remember him telling me about it three or four years ago and thinking, you know, I never, never really learned about slave uprisings. We, we know slavery existed, again, in the same way that we know that America is fundamentally stolen land that was unlawfully and illegally taken from indigenous people. We know that it was built with slave labor, but we don't really engage all that much with the mechanics of what that means. And just as much as slavery was a part of American history, so were slave revolts. So were enslaved black people who were constantly fighting back and constantly trying to escape and constantly trying to win their freedom. And so in November of 2019, um, <clears throat> almost exactly a year ago, this colleague of mine managed to find about 300 black actors, many of whom were actually descendants of people who were part of this original slave rebellion. Uh, it was called the German Coast Uprising um, and took place in uh, 1848, I believe, um, and ended up lasting about two days. And as every single slave rebellion in the US was, it was unfortunately eventually unsuccessful. But in the reenactment of this event, the ending, which was in Congo Square, this historic part of New Orleans, ended up sort of posing a more open question of what if? What if this rebellion had succeeded? What if the outcome had been totally different? And so these are photos from that, that two-day march that covered about 50 miles from St. John's Parish along the eastern bank of the Mississippi River. And then I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time here. The last thing I want to talk about is, so a lot of my work and a lot of the talks that I give in classrooms in particular, try to touch on who is responsible for telling our stories, who is responsible for the narratives that we are most familiar with and why. And I think, you know, if you think about storytelling as not just the literal form of journalism and textbooks, but, but it's something that is sort of fundamentally a part of human language. If, if we think about storytelling as the way in which we share and preserve memories, the way in which we share stories from generation to generation, the ways in which we laugh and remember, we're all storytellers. We all, we all contribute to sort of the collective storytelling. But at the same time, unfortunately, the, the record 
the most significant record of who we are as humans has for a very long time been in the hand of one very specific demographic. And that has largely been Western white cisgender men. And there is nothing wrong with that individual perspective, but if it is the only perspective that we consume, that becomes a problem. That becomes very toxic and that becomes very one-sided. And I'm sure you will hear the same thing from Michael Santiago when you hear him speak in a couple of weeks. But you know, a, a significant problem with the photojournalism industry is that 85% of working news photographers are men. And while for a long time, I think we have told ourselves in the journalism industry that we are these third party unbiased observers that's maybe not really true, right? Because our identities and our lived experiences and the ways in which we interact with people and the world, that deeply informs how we see and how we photograph. And my access to a community or a story, my ability to photograph something because I'm a woman or because I'm Vietnamese or because I'm short or any other number of things, that changes if, if I am a different characteristic if I am of a different community of a different group. And so when we are used to only ever seeing politics or sports or hard news or conflict through the eyes and lived experience of male photographers, that, that again, that becomes deeply toxic. It means that we are consuming information and consuming our own collective history purely through the male gaze. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we change that. And so I, I started this nonprofit <clears throat> about three and a half years ago called Women Photograph. Um, it's first and foremost meant to be a hiring database of women and non-binary photographers. We currently have, I think, close to 1,100 independent women and non-binary photographers based in about 110 countries around the world. Um, I'm going to quickly switch over to the website just so I can give you a little bit more of an overview of what it looks like. Whoop. There we go. Um, so this is the database. And then in addition, we also have a grants program. Um, I think to date we have awarded about $160,000 in project grants to photographers. We have an annual mentorship program. So for the women and non-binary photographers or would-be photographers in this class, um, it is open to anyone who is within the first five years of their professional practice. Uh, we have an annual workshop that we're actually in the middle of right now. Um, it is regrettably entirely virtual this year, which is very sad, but on the bright side, it means that our students this year are from 45 different countries, which is very fun. Um, and then one of the things that is deeply important to me about Women Photograph is we collect hiring and publishing statistics on the industry, um, because as much as I like to yell about the injustice and the structural problems with not having enough women within photojournalism, um, it becomes significantly more obvious what exactly the problem is when you look at the number of lead photos on the front pages of these eight international newspapers. And you see, for instance, that in all of 2019, only 7.7% .7 of front page photos on the Wall Street Journal were made by women. And only 10.7% of front page photos in the Globe and Mail were made by women. Um, and understanding the impact that has on how we see and how we consume the news. Um, so I welcome you to browse the website and take a look. And I think I'm gonna stop that very <laughs> long rant there and hopefully open up for some questions. That was wonderful, thank you. <laughs> that was great to of see course. all that work. There are a few questions we'll get to in a sec, um, but if you have more, please uh, drop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and I just had, I have a bunch of questions, but one for me and then we'll, we'll move over to everyone else. But sure. early on you were talking about your transition from daily work to, to documentary long form work. And you used the word slow, which I thought was a really interesting word. And I wondered if that means something different to you than long form, or if there's a reason you use that word or, or maybe not. Um, I don't know that it necessarily means anything different, but I think literally for me, slow journalism, I, I think you can make long form journalism that isn't slow, maybe I'll put it that way. And I, you know, for me, my best work and the most meaningful work comes when I'm not on deadline, when I am allowed to take months in a community. And, you know, I, I didn't say this explicitly, but, you know, in, in the process of starting that project, Signs of Your Identity on the boarding schools, I made 
a fatal error in judgment in what I photographed and why I thought it was important to photograph that. And I, I created a body of work that I think was deeply stigmatizing and problematic and judgmental. And because I had the luxury of working in that slow way, I didn't have an editor or a publication waiting for me requiring that I file images that were going to be published the next day or the next week. I had the luxury to go back because I was working in a grant based way and say, hey, I'm so sorry, I got it wrong. I need to go back and start over again. That That is such a privilege to be able to work in that way, to say, nope, I, I'm an outsider. I got it wrong. I need to try again until I get it right. And unfortunately, I think often journalists either can't or won't do that because a lot of journals and outlets don't have the budgets anymore. And so when we don't have budgets, we don't have time. Um, and you know, time sometimes is the only way that we really are able to deeply understand a community, especially one that's not our own. Absolutely, yeah, wonderful. Thanks. Let me let me jump to other people's questions so I don't monopolize you, um, <laughs> and I'll do them in the order they came in. So the first is from Jeff. He says, "Does your experience with architecture have any impact on how you approach photojournalism or the structure of your photography?" Your <sighs> You know, I think it probably does. I would like to say that it doesn't because, you know, I, my mother's an attorney, my father's a doctor. I studied architecture to keep them happy for four more years while I pretended I was going to do something respectable and instead jumped ship and beta, became a journalist. Um, and so I, I didn't consciously study something because I thought it would have an impact on my practice as a photographer, but at the same time, I'm very sure that it did, whether or not I knew it. Um, you know, I think my double exposure work is in a lot of ways very structural. I think the ways in which I think about making photography, especially in sort of less traditional ways, um, is quite structural. So yeah, you know, I, I can't necessarily describe how, but I'm sure, I'm sure that thinking about space and thinking about the ways in which we occupy structures has is, is impacted the way I see and the way I photograph. The, the double exposure project, uh from the boarding school project. Is that collaborative with the subjects to pick the second image or how are you selecting that? And then how are you thinking about design and structure? You know, the funny thing is it didn't start out, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see if my book is actually in a place where I can grab it easily because I would love, uh, sorry, do you mind if I actually just, I'm gonna grab my book off my bookshelf because you can maybe see a little better how I formatted. <laughs> And then I promise I'll get to everyone else's questions. I feel like I should tell a joke or <laughs> sing a song. Don't want to hear that though. <clears throat> Kurt Chandler suggests I tap dance <laughs> or just stretch. I'll do that. Oh, good. Um, it's kind of sad that I haven't needed to find one of these in so long that I can only find a wrapped one, but I'm gonna open it up because I wanna talk about this. Um, so the, the first, the very first set of images that I made, which are the ones that I showed you, were in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, and those were not collaborative because I was still figuring out my process at the time. I wasn't totally sure. I knew that I needed to do something different. I just wasn't totally sure what. Um, and I just wanted to show you that in, in the book of this work that I eventually published, um, and this is maybe where the architecture training comes in, what I wanted to make sure I did um, was both respect the identity of each individual person who I documented, but also make the double exposure visible. So these uh, transparent overlays allow you to see the portrait as well as the double exposure. Um, and once I had this book, once I had done this sort of first chapter of the work, on all subsequent trips. So, you know, I've just wrapped three years worth of work on this project in the United States. Then I was able to actually say to people, this is exactly what I'm doing. And organically, the project became much more collaborative because then people, once they understood the process, they would say, oh, well, the thing you need to photograph for my double exposure is going to be this part of the school or is going to be this thing that I remember very firmly. And so, you know, while every person in this book was able to see the double exposure, was able to sign off and say, yes, this feels representative, this feels right to me, or no, I don't want you to use that image. Um, it, it wasn't what I would consider a truly collaborative process, but but going forward, it, it has become more and more collaborative. And I think that's, that's a really important evolution of the project. That leads me to more questions, but I'm gonna to jump to other people, so we'll do that. <laughs> 
Uh, Emily asks, how difficult is it uh, for you to manage the social life and work if you're traveling back and forth? She wants to eventually be able to travel for work, but wants to find some sort of balance in her life. Oh boy. Um, so I'm a really bad person to answer this question because not only do I spend roughly 10 months of my year on the road, I also run a nonprofit, which is a second full-time job. So I have very bad work-life balance. I don't advocate that you do that. Um, I, I'm okay with it because I have a very manic work energy and I kind of thrive and enjoy being that way. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I do value my friendships very highly. Um, I am very great, you know, women photograph in its own way is a very tight knit group of people who share resources and support and are an incredible community. So, you know, that I am working constantly. I, I work, you know, 14 to 15 hour days, almost every day of the week, but I, but I am also, you know, very grateful for and reliant on my social network. So it's possible if also potentially deeply unhealthy. <laughs> we'll see if Emily responds with a follow-up to that. Um, and this comes back a little bit to the double exposure project, I guess. What do you think is the best way to build trust and a relationship with people you meet? Um, well, his example is like Hassan, to make them feel comfortable enough to share their story. That's a really good question. And you know, the thing that I say to all students and excuse my French is, people have really good bullshit detectors, right? You know, I think they really know, are you coming up to them and asking them questions because you're doing something for an assignment or something because it's work, or are you doing it because you care about them and you're genuinely curious and you genuinely wanna know about them and what they've been through and what they can share with you. Um, and those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Obviously you can be on an assignment, you can be working and you can also deeply care about the people and the issues that you're documenting. Um, but I, I think that that genuine care is really at the root of having people open up because most of us want to share our story, right? Most of us want to connect with other people. We want to share, we want to, again, you know, it's, it's, that, it's that storytelling being the fundamental fabric of humanity. We want to share our stories with others most of the time. Um, it's just figuring out how do you convince a total stranger who you have never met before, I am the right vehicle, I am the right person for you to just open up and share your life story. And so I think, you know, sometimes that's learned and that's something you have to sort of work your way into. Um, and sometimes it's just, it's a natural trait that, you know, some journalists are just magnetic and they sort of have that, like, tell me your secrets, you know, written on their face somehow. Um, but it is, I think the, the most important part of it is just, you have to care. When you did the, um, the body of work in Ohio of the schools that had um, mascots, um, the Redskins and whatever the other ones were, was that a different kind of issue? Because were, the, were they suspicious of you or did you explain what your... It was a very different issue. Um, and I, I didn't like it and I can't totally place my finger on why I didn't like it. I was completely transparent about what I was working on and why. And I would say to school administrators and athletic directors, look, I think this is a really important conversation we need to have. Different pro sports teams are now dealing with, do they keep the name? Do they change them? Do they get rid of mascots? We need to talk to kids about what that means for them and their school mascots. And so, you know, more than 50% of the schools I approached were just like, no, thank you. We, we're not gonna get involved with this. Um, so, you know, there was no artifice. There was no like gotcha journalism. Um, and even though I, I obviously personally deeply disagree with this practice that we somehow continue, I, I still felt bad about it somehow. And again, I think that's just, you know, the deep empath in me thinking like, uh, this, this is not like the way in which I really want to be a journalist. But I also, I think these are conversations that we really have to have. And I think it's kind of my responsibility as a non-native journalist to face the supremacist racist side of the conversation um sort of the other half of the work that i was doing yeah yeah do you did it interfere with your photography do you think were you were you at all i don't know more shy or more reticent about the images you made or or once you got to shoot did it all sort of go away um i don't know it's a it's a really good question i'm, I'm really proud of some of those images um i think i did feel uncomfortable the entire time and again i you know i was 
I kept questioning myself, but at the same time, I was like, look, I'm being honest about why I'm here. I'm being transparent about my process. To me, those are the most inalienable tenets of journalism is being transparent and being honest. And as long as I'm doing that, this is okay. It's, this is hard and it's uncomfortable, but we need to have the conversation. So I'm going to do that. And so, you know, I, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it, but I, I'm still glad that I did it. Interesting. Um, uh, Kurt Chandler, one of our professors asked, can you describe the research process you use to find new projects and the research you do before beginning the actual photography part? Oh, I love research. I go down the just the longest internet rabbit hole research sessions. Um, it's it's both one of those things where I think every single long term project of mine has been partially the result of some like accidental single line I've read in an article or a law review or a medical journal. Um, you know, like this signs of your identity, a now six plus year long project that I have worked on um, was literally was that one line in a UN report that said that First Nations Canadians have the fastest growing rate of HIV. Um, I ended up spending three years photographing World War II reenactors in the UK because I read a single line in a Guardian story about how that was a huge thing in England and I thought that's interesting and different and I grew up in Civil War reenactment territory in the US and I thought World War II reenactment as an idea was fascinating to me as someone who's Jewish and has connections and relatives who were in the Holocaust. Um, so a, yeah, a lot of it is serendipity and I think always being curious and always just asking yourself, does that make sense? Or is that weird? Or is that something that maybe could be something bigger? And then also having a very obsessive, like focused need to then take this one little thing and not let it go and, you know, find out every single existing piece of historical documentation I can on it. Um, so for me, you know, I think a lot of photographers, documentary photographers work in insanely different ways, but for me, research is a huge part of it um, and contextualizing in both existing work and just in, in historical, social, political, economic context is, is really important for me. Do you have uh, go-to journals or magazines or sources when you're looking for a story or that you just like to read where your stories have come from? Not specifically. The thing that I realized when I went to that AIDS conference in Australia in 2014 um, is that scientific conferences and medical journals and medical literature in general are an incredible source for journalistic projects because scientists are so bad at speaking in accessible ways. And they do really cool, interesting, important work. And they're doing all of this amazing stuff. And the average person cannot take a medical journal and understand what the hell is going on. And so if you can just be that go between, you know, and that's that's half of our job, right? Is being that go between um, that translates the technical and the crazy and the hard to understand and we make it accessible for the general public. That's that is so often what we do. Um, but I, I think that yeah the medical community is a really great source of project ideas because they just they they often do not have the capacity to sort of translate into simple English what they're working on with love to our scientists, <laughs> doctor friends. We probably don't have any listening, so you're good. Um, what are some of these other questions? How do you network with editors and funders who may be able to underwrite your work? How did you, I mean, you talked about Pulitzer, but what are some of the other ways you do that? Um, it's, it's a long, slow process. And I, I don't think there's any magical formula to figuring out how to do it. Um, <clears throat> and I hate how much the photojournalism world is still really reliant on who you know and how well you can network. Um, it's just very unfortunate. It's not a true meritocracy. Photojournalism as an industry is not very accessible. You have to have some degree of financial privilege even to be able to start in photojournalism because God, our gear is really expensive. And that's, you know, with every generation it's gotten slightly more accessible and photographic technology has gotten slightly more accessible, but it's, it's still, to be a you know pro level photographer, you still need what like a ten thousand dollar investment when you graduate from college, and a lot of people can't do that. Um, when it comes to funding sources, I you know I think that can be more meritocratic, but it is also it's a numbers game. There are so many deserving, talented photographers out there. It's kind of just you have to keep throwing darts at the dartboard until something sticks. Um, and I you know I can't tell you how many grant applications I submitted before I got my first ever grant. Um, and 
you just, you can't be discouraged. You can't take it personally. You just have to go to professors you trust and colleagues you trust and maybe reach out to a grantor who rejected you and say, hey, what would you recommend I do next time to be more successful in my application? And you just, you keep workshopping, you keep editing, you keep making it better. And eventually you will get that grant. Um, so, you know, my work is supported by the Pulitzer Center and National Geographic Society and Open Society Foundations, and the Magnum Foundation. Um, these are really amazing organizations that are deeply committed to supporting long form photojournalism and I wouldn't be able to exist without them. And I do truly think there is a pretty significant amount of funding out there for photographers, but it's a lot of work and it's sort of its own independent skill set. Learning how to write good grant applications is not necessarily, so I, and I don't know because I never studied photojournalism and I didn't go to J school. So I don't, I, maybe I'm just, you know, making this up, but I, you know, I don't necessarily think it's an innate part of photojournalism education. Um, and it, it ought to be because it is, it's a really useful skill um, to be able to speak compellingly and succinctly about the work you're doing and why it's important, why it matters and why you deserve to get $10,000 to go spend a few months working on it. Did you, are there resources for learning those skills or was it just sort of trial and error for you and talking to other people you knew who have done it? I, mean, I, think it I think a lot of it was trial and error and I, I love writing and I, you know, I started out wanting to be a writer. So, you know, it's maybe slightly more natural for me than it is for some photographers who are significantly more visual people, but, you know, I, I definitely, it took me a while to master it. Um, and so, you know, if anyone here is interested, I, I'm very free with sharing old grant applications of mine that were successful. And so if anyone wants to reach out, I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, but, I, you know, I think your colleagues are your best resource. Share with, you know, first of all, I know that the photojournalism industry feels like it operates out of scarcity and in a lot of ways it does. But it is so much better if we operate as a community and help each other out and share resources and support each other. That is really the only way we can make this dumb industry sustainable because it's just, it doesn't need to be cutthroat. It doesn't need to be hyper competitive. I know things are grim and look not great with all these media giants buying everything up and driving them into the ground, but we can do our jobs. And photojournalism continues to be absolutely vital and deeply necessary, but we have to help each other out. So, you know, get your friends to read your applications, get them to say, hey, this makes sense, but this makes no sense. And hey, I really love the way you explain this thing, but I'm not sure why the story matters. And you know, just just work through things, help each other out, and and you'll get there. Great advice. Um, oh, this is a good question from from my assume student. Um, how do you think your personal upbringing has affected the way you tell other people's stories? Oh, that's a really good question. I you know, and I. I don't know that I thought about it all that much until fairly recently, um, which is probably embarrassing because almost all of my work in some way looks at the legacy of Western colonization and what that means and how that shapes our understanding of and our relationship to different power structures. And it shouldn't be obvious because you know I'm, I'm half Vietnamese. My mother was born in Vietnam. My father's parents came from Eastern Europe. I, you know, colonialism and sort of the oppression of both sides of my identity is a, a pretty baked in part of who I am. My mother in particular has not let a day go by where she doesn't rant about the fact that Vietnam was colonized by first the Chinese and then the French and then the Americans and we beat them all and we kicked them all out of our country and we're still strong. And so, you know, that thinking about that and understanding what that means for national identity, for a collective identity, that is very much a part of my subconscious. And so I think, you know, that's probably a huge reason why I've been drawn to the stories that I've reported on. That's very interesting. Um, we have just a couple of more questions and, and we're doing pretty well on time. We'll, we'll get to all of them, I think. Um, what do you think the appropriation of indigenous and other foreign cultures says about America as a whole? <laughs> oh, that's a, a loaded question. question. <laughs> Um, wow, that where to begin, you know, I think, I think we are going through a very interesting, very complicated year. Um, I think the events of June and the conversations sparked by George Floyd's death and the Black Lives Matter movement and what it means to acknowledge and see and hear people who come from historically oppressed and continually oppressed communities um, 
to sort of reposition ourselves and our understanding of Black and Indigenous Americans has, I, I don't think we've ever made as much collective progress as we have in this year. And yet we still have a really long way to go. Um, as communities, socially, politically, economically, we have a really important election coming up that we need to not screw up. Um, and, you know, we, we still are getting a lot of things wrong. We still, you know, it, any substantial metric you can think of for the health and well being of Indigenous and Black Americans is terrible. And there is no good explanation for that other than racism, right? And so I think, unfortunately, when it comes to conversations like appropriation, which if you're, you know, if, if we're playing the oppression Olympics and we're ranking hierarchically what matters and what doesn't, it's really easy for someone to say, oh, well, the Washington Redskins, that doesn't matter when you have people on reservations who don't have access to running water or health care or they're being disenfranchised and they can't vote. So why, why should we worry about this thing? And sure, it may not seem immediately urgent. It may not seem as critical as, do you have water? Are you allowed to cast your ballot? But they're all connected. They're all related. And if we're allowing ourselves to dehumanize people and think less of them in small ways, it's really easy to make that bigger and bigger and bigger and dehumanize and think less of people in big ways. And, you know, I think in seeing that in a very specific context with mascots, seeing how if you think it's okay and you make it normal with teenagers, when they grow up and are adults, they think it's totally okay at the pro level. It's, it's the same thing, right? We escalate things because we normalize them and we have to stop normalizing them. We have to, you know, we have to understand that there is something complicated and not okay with the fact that until 1978 in the United States, it was illegal for indigenous people to practice their culture. There was actually a ban on all indigenous religion until 1978 in the United States. So when a white person in New Mexico holds a sweat lodge and charges $800 a day for a bunch of white people to go and sweat, that's a problem. There, there, there are some real structural, historical, cultural ironies in that it's, it's not, you know, I, th I think, again, I'm going off on a really long tangent and a really long rant here, but, you know, it's easy to think of them as like, oh, that, it's just this little thing. It doesn't matter that much. But, but if we place them in the longer context, and this is why I go down those research rabbit holes, because we, we can never forget the contextual things and events and legislation that came before when we piece them all together, that's when we start to realize, oh, oh, that's, what, that's why this is important. That's why we have come down this road and we still have not learned. So that, sorry, was an incredibly long answer. No, no, that was great. I had no idea that that law was on the books. The uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act was not passed until 1978. That's astounding, yeah. Um, so we have one more question. I, probably a good place to end. We'll let you go because I, I feel bad. It's late for you. That's okay. I'm good. I drink a lot of coffee. I'm good. <laughs> um, the, uh, going back to the immigrant story, the Syrians, the family, Hassan and his and his brothers, has it been published? <laughs> it was really the question. And if not, like, where can we see it or what's the plan for it? Yes. And, and Professor Chandler has it right. Um, he seems to be following my work. I, it was published by Mashable. It's so almost all of my work. I actually prefer to work on independently with grants without editorial oversight, because that means that I get to go off and do whatever I want. And I don't have an editor going, hey, did you remember to do this thing? Or, hey, have you thought about if you'd like to do this thing? So I usually prefer to work in that way. And no one bothers me and no one tells me what to do. And I'm very stubborn. and I have my process and I like to follow it. Um, but the photo editor I have known the longest and worked with the longest throughout my career. I've worked with him since I was first at the Wall Street Journal in 2011. So it's been about nine years that we have worked together at every publication he's been at. He is now the art director at Mashable. Um, and so when you know, I just on a whim with no assignment, I went to Calais, I met Hassam. I thought, this is an incredible story his selfies, his photographs, my documentation of what he's going through now, that like this is a really compelling photo package to humanize and make relatable and understandable the Syrian refugee crisis, I immediately contacted him and said, I, I think this is special. And then, and you know, again, like our trust in each other, our trust in the collective process then allowed me to go and say, hey, I got this Instagram message from someone who claims to be his older brother. Do you want to commission a part two? And I'll go to Norway and do that. And, you know, that turned into me going to Qatar to meet the parents and me going to Denmark to meet the other brother and me going to Tunisia to document the wedding. 
Um, so it is probably the longest running and sort of most unusual editorial partnership I've had, but I, I trust this editor deeply. He's incredible. And I think he also trusts me. And so that's really what makes the partnership work. Got it. I actually had missed Kurt's second question where he mentioned that it was unmatchable. So, um, and his follow-up to that is, is opportunities. Are you finding more in the sort of digital native place or, or where is your work mostly getting published and seen? Yeah. It's a funny mix. And I think, you know, some little part of me, because I started out in newspapers and I'm like just old enough that print is still king to me. I think I, I, a little part of me, irrational though it may be, still feels that way. And that, you know, having something to hold in my hands still feels better than like scrolling through Google Chrome or whatever. Um, but, you know, the truth is, the digital spaces reach more people and are more democratic and more accessible and can be translated in a second. And so, you know, while it was thrilling and a huge honor to be able to work for National Geographic magazine on my first story and that like that holding that magazine in my hand was so exciting. I also, you know, I, I have 100,000 followers on Instagram and that's the size of the readership of a mid-sized American newspaper. And I can communicate directly with 100,000 people when I want to go behind the scenes when I'm on the road and say, hey, this is something I learned today. And this is some person I met and here's their story. And here's the history of this project that I'm working on. And I think that's exciting and thrilling too. So I know that's not really an answer. I, I think all of it is important. I think it all fits together because we reach different people with different media, um, whether that's exhibitions or public art or photo books or National Geographic or Instagram, You know, I, we have different opportunities to speak to different people. Um, and so I just, I, I like playing around with it and trying different things in different spaces and, and seeing how that changes the way in which I communicate with people. Do you, so having that large following on Instagram, do you think of that as sort of a publication that you, like how do you treat what you're posting contributing to your own Instagram versus other publications? And does it change what you photograph or how you photograph? changes how I photograph but I kind of view it as like you know here here's a backseat here, come along for the ride here you know you can and it's also there are all of these things and these insights and there's a degree of transparency that I can't necessarily grant someone who's reading a story of mine in a magazine where it's intensely curated and copy edited and fact checked and so obviously it is held to the highest possible standards of journalistic integrity but I also hold myself to the highest possible standards of journalistic integrity. And I like being able to share some of the behind the scenes when I'm in the field and say, look, this is something that I dealt with today. It was kind of weird. I don't know what to do, but this is what I decided to do and why. And I, I think, you know, we're in this really crazy, sad moment in America where journalists and the public's trust in journalists is at an all time low. And so I, I consider it both a privilege and a responsibility to be able to say, look, we, we, can, we can put this back together. We can build this back up and I can show you, this is how I work as someone who deeply prides myself on my ethical code and the way in which I work and, and the integrity and the transparency of my process. Let me show you, let me talk you through the story, why it matters, why I want you to understand these things. Um, so it's, it's it's a very different way of engaging with an audience, but I, I really treasure it. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I think we've probably hit our limit here um, for you and our audience, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much for having me and thank you guys all for tuning in. It was really nice to chat with you. Thank you all, uh, enjoy your weekend. Remember two weeks, we'll be back again with, uh, with another talk. Yeah, great. Thank you, Daniela. Have a good night, bye yeah. guys. Bye, everybody.